Let's talk about parlays that you would suggest. This would be a good fill-in-the-blank time to parlay. Correlations. I'll give examples. So, This is Sharp Money with Patrick Maher on VSIN, the sports betting network. Professional better. Steve Fezzik joins us, of course, the original weight loss challenger, Steve Fezzik, pregame.com, at Fezzik Sports, two Zs and a K. He's got a lot of notes today, and there's a lot to get to. Maybe we should start with your thoughts on the weight loss challenge. Both guys are killing it. Dustin is down 34 pounds in eight weeks, and Jonathan Bontobel down almost 18 pounds in eight weeks. That's pretty good, huh? That's outstanding, especially with Evil Pie. Just a block down the street with the, get this, Dustin, $8 slice. You can get a goblin slice and a beer Don't tell me this. for $9. 2 to 4 p.m. Your show ends at 3. You can get over there. You got 50 minutes there. Now, I did meet Jonathan Von Tobel downtown right around the corner right by Evil Pie. There's a Thai place. Okay. I'm trying to get the name of it. It lay le- Thai. Real hard name to remember. Lay Thai. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. Like, really, really great and really good prices, too. I can't recommend that place enough. Okay. Now, you mentioned recommendations. The king of Las Vegas, he should be the mayor one day, is one Steve Fezzik. Okay, so let's talk about this. Uh, you met up with your buddy, Will Hill, and his beautiful family. He's got four kids, a beautiful wife. They are enjoying the Vegas experience during spring break. Dustin asked a great question during the break. What would you suggest to, and there's plenty of people listening all over the country, if they were to bring the family to Vegas, how should they attack it, Fez? All right, I got five options for you. So let's start with free. Let's go Angel Park. Um, That's not really free, but it's close to it. They have a, it's a golf course extravaganza. They have a miniature golf desert putting course. Go at twilight. You can go ahead and overlook the valley if your children are a little bit older. They have a par three course with lights, uh, 12 holes. That is a great golf option uh, because you don't want to go to Top Golf. That's more of an adult type of venue. Um, uh, Old school. Go, Go to the Mirage. It isn't closed yet. The volcano's still exploding. Go see the Mirage exploding on sunset and go over to the conservatory at Bellagio. That's free. That's very nice to walk through there. I haven't done that yet. I heard that's great. Uh, That's awesome. Uh, Excalibur has a night show. You can watch the dueling nights um, go out there. There's an evil night, a good night. It's just a lot of fun. Uh, Red Rock Conservatory, it's close, 17-mile drive, good hiking trails. And in summertime, We have a 12,000-foot mountain. All right, it's 11,800. You don't want to be hiking that. I have hiked it in my youth, but you want to go Cathedral Rock. It's like a one-hour hike, beautiful views of downtown Mount Charleston, about 30 degrees cooler in the summertime. Do the Cathedral Rock hike um, up in Mount Charleston. Beautiful. Great recommendation. So if you're planning a trip, you can hit Fez. He's always... Amiable on Twitter, at Fezzik Sports, maybe a suggestion or two, some free picks as well. So a great option for the family. Now, this cracked me up because while we had Will Hill on, not only did you send a ton of betting notes in particular earlier this morning, you then said prime rib disparity downtown specials, and you started listing (laughs) prime rib choices in downtown Las Vegas. What's that all about? So I don't understand this. Help me out. Prime rib is basically prime rib, right? I know there's like the Lowry's prime rib, which is gourmet, but Every slab of prime rib is marbled and delicious, and we can't eat any anymore, Dustin. I'm sorry. But um, the disparity in pricing, because on the marquee, I'm like, what's this? The Four Queens has a $23 prime rib special. But the El Cortez has a $16 prime rib special. And what's this? Um, at the Fremont, Tony Roma's, a rib place, has a $10.95 prime rib special. Patrick? It would be like three gas stations, and one's charging like double for gas, another one. I'm going to go driving for my prime rib where it's ten ninety five. How do the other two places stay in business? <laughs> that is a tremendous question. That's for the families visiting Vegas, a little prime rib intel from Mr. Fez. Okay, let's circle back to the notes. Why don't we start, because you've got a lot of interesting notes. Why don't we start with the NBA world? You said the NBA world has changed unders got hammered immediately on the play-in games. You simply cannot wait to make these bets as far as the totals. Yeah, so I remember, and I'm old, so like 
10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, they would put up the the NBA playoffs would start Saturday and Sunday. There wasn't a play-in game, but still the under was the way to go because playoff games are lower scoring. And at my leisure, I'd hop into my car, and I used to own an MR2, if you can believe it, a crappy old MR2 with air conditioning breaking down, and I would drive all over town because to the Imperial Palace, and I'd go out to the, the, the Stardust and the Desert Inn and all these places, and I would be bombing away, playing unders, and there's plenty of time. There's no sense of urgency, but it's a different world. So the play-in games, the Lakers, Pels, they open 228 and a half, so do the Warriors, Kings, and it's a race, man. It's like you've got like two minutes once that number goes up. You want to get under 228, you better go now. Because if you don't, you're going to be staring at 225 and a half within a little while. So uh, there's no time to get in a car, to drive to Red Rock or Mount Charleston or any parts in between. You better not be getting your prime rib dinner, Patrick. You better, better be ready to fire, taking your little fat finger and hitting under as quickly as possible, or you're going to be staring at 225 instead of 228 and a half. And I did play all four games in the play-ins to go under. But I wanted to ask you guys, then there's some talk about, well, should the Lakers even really win this game? Like, you could, you could argue maybe there's a path. So if it's not critical to win this game, my whole point is both teams need the game like blood in a playoff game to play under. If they don't need it like blood, maybe it's not as good a bet. Oh, that's interesting. I don't. We talked about this with Will when he was on, Steve. I think it makes sense to all of us. You know who it doesn't make sense to? LeBron James. Yes. He cannot play chicken with a chance to go further into the playoffs here, advance past the playing game. He can't afford for his legacy to not have another opportunity to make a run. He can't play that game of picking who he's going to dance with in the next round. Let's just... I ha- Yeah. Go get, ahead, Steve. Let's get to the dance, right, Patrick? Would you agree? And then we'll, we'll I, talk. I, I have to believe, and I mean this, I think uh, Adam Silver placed a phone call directly to LeBron James and said, what are we thinking here with this play-in? Uh, we need full participation <laughs> because it would be a sham if they were, as you say, to tank and not end up matching up against the Nuggets. So remember, 7-8 goes directly into the seven seed. So yes, I, I, I think it would be foolhardy to believe that they won't both give an effort, the Pels and the Lakers, Steve. You know, it's funny how many back deals get made and things like that. I remember... Um, Years and years ago, I tied for first in, in a Leroy's college football uh, contest. So there was one. There was a playoff week after it, and Jimmy Vaccaro was talking to me. He's like, "Oh, I see you're in the playoffs here. Great job, Steve." And I was like, "Yeah, we're going to chop the prize. We're both going to like pick the same te- seven teams this last week, you know, and that way we'll push." It's like, what are you talking about, Steve? He's like, he's like, no, no, you're not, you are not. It's like Vegas treasure. Jimmy Vaccaro is like, Steve, you're not going to do that. If you need to get a hold of this other gentleman and you guys want to cut out some kind of deal and you need help with like the legal paperwork or whatever right. to chop, that's fine. But we are not going to have a situation where our in in our finals we're going to have two guys picking the same seven games. Now, as far as the NBA postseason in particular. Is there a way over the past 20 plus years you approach the next two months? Is there tips you can give to new betters approaching the NBA, whether it be futures or individual games? Sure. So obviously the zigzag, it's not dead, but it's barely breathing. What I mean by zigzag is whoever wins and covers the last game tends to be the team you want to bet against the following games. So um, if you have a situation, I, I like the underdogs myself. So week one, our game one, if you have the underdog on the road and they lose, all things being equal, it is rarely correct to back the favorite game two. But the zigzag is priced in. So what will happen is a team will be like an eight-point favorite game one, Patrick, and they'll win by nine. They'll cover and win. And then game two, well, wait a minute. They were an eight-point favorite and they showed they're better than that. And yet the game two line will drop from eight to like seven half or seven. So there's a point spread tax. And the biggest tax is on these 0-2 series. How many times do we see it that the better team is home? They win both games at home and they're laying six game one in game two. And then they go on the road. What's this? Not only is the road team, now the home team, down 0-2, they're laying five and a half. But they're laying like four and a half, five in the first half. So that um, it used to be that was one of the best bets in sports. Back the O2 team 
um, at home in the first half, the tax, I think, has gotten just too high to make that profitable. So those kind of get shot down. I will say this. One thing that I really do like is whenever a, a series has a preponderance of overs, and this does still happen, and I, I, I quantify it by two more overs and unders. So let's say they're in game five of the series and there's been three overs and one under. That's a great contrarian play to go under at that point because usually the totals aren't compromised. They're still as high as they were to start the series. And the deeper you go into a series, more often than not, the more the unders instead of the overs are the way to go. Yeah, Steve, you've been pre- you've been preaching, and I was going to ask you about the zigzag because you've been talking about ten plus years with us the zigzag theory when it comes to NBA postseason betting, and I was curious if it was still something you looked to, so that you answered that question right there. Um, do you, as far as futures are concerned, you're generally a game to game guy. Do you have an opinion about the NBA futures? You know, I really don't. I think it's. It, one thing I do think we can learn from Connecticut in the NCAA tournament, I always talk about the mechanical parlay. You'll do better by the mechanical parlay just taking your money, you're going to invest $100 in a team, and rolling it over and betting it each and every game on the money line. I don't think that's necessarily true on the prohibitive favorites. In Connecticut, it wasn't the case. You were much better off just betting Connecticut plus 475 than betting them each and every game. I think the Celtics probably apply It'd be better to just bet the Celtics to win than to roll it over in each series, I believe. We were just talking about tips for people like the Hills who are visiting Vegas, and Steve gave five great ideas if you were to bring the family. You got me thinking while you were talking about advantage playing when it comes to slots and the table games. Are there just a few, uh, I guess, axioms you live by or you would spend give advice to others coming to Vegas to play some of the table games and some of the, obviously we were just talking about some of the video poker as well. What would you say, Steve? Never ever pay for a drink in Vegas. It's too easy to get free drinks. You just walk up to a bar, put a hundred dollars at the Vegas bar and wait for your bartender to walk on over, play one hand, 25 cent video poker, order your drink. Then when he comes back over three minutes later with your apple martini, then play one more hand, so that'll be like $2.50 in action. If you're at a 3% disadvantage, you're paying nothing for your free drink. Take care of your bartender. As long as you take care of your bartender, Patrick, rinse and repeat. You can keep going until basically you're uh, unable to drive and stumble out of here. Yes. You are somebody that's known, and I think a, a few casinos say, we don't want your action when it comes to blackjack. Uh, my assumption is, as far as table games for people visiting Vegas, blackjack is the most popular. Where would you start giving a newbie advice on blackjack? Uh, this is like Las Vegas advisor Anthony Curtis stuff here, where he quantifies. You know, I'll give you a book, though, to read. It's called Comp City by Max Rubin. There's two books. And what Max Rubin, former pit boss, does is he outlines what the house edge is on everything. So, obviously, craps, if you just bet the pass line, the odds are the don't pass. It's like 1.4% against. If you bet $100 on a craps table, you're going to lose $1.40. Betting the pass or the don't pass, the don't pass is slightly better. Uh, comparable, it's 1.2% playing back or at. With craps, you can take your odds. You're going to break even playing your odds. For blackjack, if you're a basic strategy player, it's way better. You're at about a half percent disadvantage. If you're counting and you're varying your bet size, but not by a lot, you're basically break even or at a tiny edge. So you can see the beauty where if you're breaking even, then you bet a lot and you get lots of really cool comps and the like. But even if you're playing craps, um, you know what? You only lose a dollar or twenty when you bet a hundred dollars. By contrast, if you're at a slot machine, even if you're playing dollar slots, it's like five reels, so it's five dollar slots, and you can you keep hitting that button like every five seconds. Nobody wins at that. It's like I, I'm amazed. Like you look at Otani's um, impersonator. I got to address this. It's like and, Please. and 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 he loses sixteen million betting sports, and it's like a, like an eighteen percent disadvantage, and. This happens all the time. People just get addicted to gambling, and they get behind in gambling, and they think they're going to get even. You're, anyone who's listening, please, God, listen to me. You're not going to get even. You know, you know how you're going to get even? You're going to, like, study games and, like, like, be, like, meticulous and, like, learn advantage slot machines that build up and everything else. But if you were programmed to do that, you probably would have done that from the get-go. I've never seen someone who got into a, a situation where they're, they're struggling to win gambling that they're able to overcome that and suddenly become a really good advantage player. So if, if you are down 
and this happens all the time when you're betting sports. If you're down big and you've got to pay your man on Sunday night and there's a Sunday night football game, don't think you're magically going to dig out. Just dig in, pay your guy. You know what? If you can't pay your guy, it's fine. If you owe a guy $10,000 and you, and you have $1,000, you just say, I'm sorry. I don't have the money to pay you right now. I am going to pay you $300 a week as long as I can till I pay it back. I've never heard of any bookmaker in the world in that situation that's ever said anything but, okay, if that's what you got to do. You know, so, um, but the last thing you want to do is, oh, like, I know the Otani impersonator, I'll just, I'll just bet more and try to get out of this hole. You won't win. You're not going to succeed with that strategy and in any game. So I really encourage um, responsible gambling. Never, ever, ever chase your losses. There's probably a reason you're losing also. You're probably playing at a, at a disadvantage anyways. I think that's a great PSA when it comes to responsible betting. That's a good job by you, Steve. You mentioned, and we could talk a little bit about the Masters, Scheffler, A winner, Steve, already when it comes to the PGA, he's four and a half to one. U.S. Open, he's going to be close to four and a half, five to one. Probably the British Open closer to seven to one. You also mentioned Tiger over 72 and a half in round four was the best bet of the Masters. Yeah, so you love bets, and I'm going to give Will Hill credit on this one. I think he's the first one to alert me to this, and he was saying play over 72 and a half. So this is interesting. Like, imagine a baseball game where there, there was a, a team was a slight favorite and they became a minus 180 favorite. I would never recommend, hey, let's bet the Red Sox minus 180. Who cares? We could have gotten minus 120. But when it comes to prop betting and unique props, the game is completely different. So in this case, and I, it was DraftKings put up and maybe a few other places, but I didn't see it, over under Tiger Woods round four, 72 and a half. And I got to say, and, and if they get mad at me, they get mad at me. Every tra- any the, the golf expert, if they have a golf trading expert that set that line, he needs to be, what's the term in soccer when they bring you down to a lower league? Relegated. relegated. He needs to, yeah, I'm sorry, if you're the DK golf expert, Steve Fezzik is relegating you. You are going to go and you're going to price the Olympics and we're going to get a new golf guy. Just that one thing, because think about this, and I know I'm past posting and there's a $50 fine, but that's the stupidest line that you are ever going to see. Anyone who watched Tiger round three, I didn't even watch him. I just got like little reports to say, Patrick, if I would have asked you set an over under on what Tiger would shoot in round four, even with better weather, what would you have 72 as par? What would you have set it at? Well, he shot an 82 in round three, I believe. So I would have set it closer to 77. Exactly. It's easy because we know he did indeed shoot a 77. So your number is spot on. I, w- I used the case. I said, Boy, I know the over-unders were like, you know, way lower for most players. But given how bad he was round three, I, I really think I probably would have set it above 77. I might have set it at like 78 and a half, which probably would have been too high. So I would have set a bad number two. So I would have been relegated. But you know what? Since I'm not a golf expert, I'm okay with that. But my point is 72 and a half was just... It was a bad enough number that, like, I just hope there's never an inquiry, that there's some inside job of people betting Tiger over because that's, that's a 72 and a half. And by the way, old school Vegas, that's how old school Vegas got in trouble, where they would, what would happen is that there would be, um, the sports book would set a line, oh, what's the line on Notre Dame, Michigan? And we're like, oh, Michigan's plus seven and a half. And one guy could bet it, and then they'd immediately make the line plus three and a half. All right. And it'd be like, well, our buddy, we're only letting our buddies bet into stuff like that. That number is bad enough that it's just like, I, I, they'd have to explain to me how in the world they arrived at it because it just didn't make any sense to me. The, the, the uh, Steve Fezzik, professional better. The idea, and I know the boys on long shots, you know, Wes and Kelly and Matt, you know, they give out plays and you're constantly avoiding a four and a half, five to one Scotty Scheffler. What's your take overall on a short number like that on a golfer individually? Well, we've seen a lot shorter, right? We've seen Tiger against the field where I think Tiger was paying like plus 180 in some events. So Scheffler has not hit that point yet. I think probably, I mean, I'm not a golf expert, but it sure looks like this is indeed um, the best track for him, the best setup, although he's young and, you know, experience is supposed to matter, you know, at the, at the Masters um, it'll be interesting because we're talking about these other events that he's not hasn't historically been as good at. What what's what's setter line for Scheffler? What's you got to set a no vig line here? All right, so I'll set it. So I'm going to make Scotty minus three ninety plus three ninety in next year's Masters. You can go yes or no. I'd have to. Oh gosh, but I'd have to say no. Dustin. Yeah, yeah, I agree. 
But if I set it 425, you'd probably say yes, right? So see, I'm you'd be getting a little bit better. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to lay minus 425, but I'm willing to. I agree with you, Patrick. I'm willing to lay minus 390. The four dollars seems to be the the choke point for it, me. It, 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 I totally. You know, there was a t- there was a point. You mentioned plus 180 on Tiger. I believe he went off at even money in a tournament. I'll have to dig up the numbers, but he just think about have. how uh, think about how incredible that is, Steve, to go you know, off. I don't feel the 90 of even money. For those who are younger, so this was the Tiger Slam days when Tiger won four in a row. And I think he won he won 15 majors. But the key here is that, you know, he won 14 of them when he was still young. And then he stole one Masters at the end after, you know, yeah. after, after his injury. I mean, he could have, like, obliterated, you know, Jack's record and gotten, like, 23 if he could have stayed healthy. What are your – you have hockey guys – I'll ask the same question. It's just a minute. We can come back and finish the conversation. Hockey transitioning from the regular season to postseason, what's the th- first thing that pops to your mind? Under, under in game six and seven. It's, you know, it's, it's rarely wrong. I'm trying to think of what sport where an over makes sense. All I can think of is that for years the Super Bowl actually had high-scoring games. Um, but um, other than that, it's, it sure seems like these championship games and later series just um, – more often than that, Game 7 NBA, Game 7 NHL, give me the under. Okay, beautiful. Major League Baseball thoughts coming up next with Steve Fezzik. I'll just put it this way. He's not a big fan of the Colorado Rockies or the Chicago White Sox. So we'll discuss that and more with professional better. Always great to see Fez. So, Dustin, we were talking this morning about UConn and South Carolina and Scheffler. So some chalk. Now, the Chiefs weren't chalk, but of course, a dynastic run from the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl. Michigan was a shorter number. And you and Fez were talking about potentially parlaying some of the favorites. Go ahead and set up your question, and Steve has a direct answer yeah, to it. It feels like, looking back, UConn felt inevitable. Scotty Scheffler felt inevitable. Was the right move not to parlay both of them together and get really good ROI? No, horrendous. Um, and what's, what's a great point? Let's make some assumptions. Let's assume Connecticut's going to win one-fourth of the time, which I think is very conservative. I think if we had to do it again, that would be low. And Sheffler's going to win one-fourth of the time. So if we're getting three to one or better on either one of these teams, then we have good bets. And we're getting, you know, plus 450 and, and, and on both of these wagers. So they're, they're both good bets. And the ROI spikes through the roof to parlay them together. But it's still atrocious. It's still terrible wagering now, and here's why. How can that possibly be? Warning, danger, complicated math. ROI is not a good measure for how to wager properly, and here's why. So you start out with, let's say your base unit size is $100. So you bet $100 on Connecticut. Now, if you, if you shopped and you went to, like, the Profit Exchange in New Jersey or a place that has the very best number in the world, maybe you can get Connecticut plus 485 but if you put it in a parlay at some other book, you're probably only going to get plus 450. So you're going to get short paid. And you're like, well, I don't care about getting short paid. I'm going to get paid 26 to 1 because I'm parlaying it to Scotty Scheffler. But you're also getting short paid, paid on Scheffler because you're not going to get the very best number on him as well. If you got the very best number at both places, which you wouldn't, then we could at least have a conversation. But even if you did, it's still a bad way to wager. And here's why. You're used to wagering $100 on good wagers. Boom. Connecticut convoy, the Connecticut convoy rolls. You know, they go south to Flagtown and they just roll everybody and they beat everyone by double digits. All right. Well, you have won uh, $450. If you wagered $100, you have now won $450. So now you have $550 and you say, well, Fez, I haven't won anything. I just got my ticket with my parlay. Well, the implicit value of you went to prop swap and they gave you you know, the value of your ticket with, you know, at full value, it would be worth $550. So my point is, you could have just wagered that. Now you got $550. So do we like Scotty Scheffler five and a half times more than the Connecticut bet? Of course not. We should be betting a comparable amount on each and every really good wager we have. We don't magically just say, hey, we won a big bet, so now I'm just going to shove all in with Scotty Scheffler because I won uh, my college basketball tournament. So the bet sizing is all screwed up. You don't get the very best of the number in terms of your shopping. So uh, because of that, 
Kelly Criterion would say it's wrong on all levels. And I know there are some experts that right here on the show, not on this show, but on one of the segments on VEASAN, was recommending parlay Scheffler to many other things and get really big payouts. I would argue A-plus for the handicapping size. Nailed it. Scheffler, great value taking him. But there was no reason to parlay him. Just bet him. You know what? You don't need to, like, manufacture 20 to 1, 100 to 1 payouts. I can tell you that's how pros do it. If they really like a play like that, they just bet it straight. And I would encourage everyone to play that way. As you know, so many new bettors, they get very tantalized by parlays. So I was taught by the dude that growing up just to stay away from teases, stay away from parlays. I know that's not the right strategy at this point, but that's just what he told me at the time. It kind of stuck with me. Let's talk about parlays that you would suggest. Like, when are you uh, offering this would be a good fill-in-the-blank time to parlay? Correlations. I'll give examples. So I felt like, as an example, I'll, I'll just give one out. I only like to give out plays that won. So I'll bring, give out one that lost. But against Circa, I played three parlays in the NBA the final week where I had some big favorites um, and teams that had questionable motivation they were playing. So I parlayed Oklahoma City. I think I laid 12 and a half first half to over 115, and I felt that that was a good correlation. I felt like, all right, if Dallas just is mailing it in, they don't care if they win, they'll be playing no defense, and if they play no defense, Oklahoma City is more likely to cover the first half. They're more like, likely to cover – the game's more likely to go over. So I put them together because I felt the correlation was strong. I did that with Sacramento and lost. I did that with Golden State as well, first half, and won. Uh, a tricky correlation that nobody ever talks about in baseball is the home underdog to the under or the road favorite to the over. So think about this. Uh, let's say the total on a game is, I don't know, we could say seven and a half. And it's 3-3 after eight innings. Well, if the home team wins, good chance they win 4-3, to three, right? But if the road team wins, you have a much better shot at stealing that over. Heck, it could be 7-4 to four after 11 innings and the like. So, again, um, you used to be able to parlay the – I'm old enough to remember parlaying run lines, which was phenomenal. Can't do that. But even so, if the road team wins, you tend to get all nine innings – you have to get all nine innings. If the home team wins, oftentimes you only get eight and a half innings. So a home underdog to the under, a road favorite to the over, are good correlated parlays to the point where if you like, let's say the Yankees are playing at Oakland, if you like the Yankees and you like the over, you really have to put them together in a parlay for part of your bet also. Yeah, correlation betting, correlated betting, the, I, I learned – about that with your CD series you did with Kevin O'Neill back in the day. So that was my first, and it was a great, those were great. I used to listen to those in my Kia. It was like seven straight hours of betting talk, which was tremendous, and that's where I first heard of correlative betting from Steve. So college, um, bet, bit, one, one more please. if I may. College please? basketball. Let's say you like the over and you like a three-point favorite. So think about this. Yeah, they could win by 18, and then you're probably going to get screwed. But if the three-point favorite covers, I come to you from the future, Dustin, the three-point favorite covered, how much do you think they're probably going to win by? Well, with free throws, at least three. They have to win by more than three. Give me a number, though, more often I'd than that. Say, about, I'd say five. Five or even seven, somewhere around there. Guess what happens when a team's ahead by six? The three-point favorite covers, and what happens in the final minute? Foul. Yep. Foul. Foul. And you get all these extra points. So the minus three to the over is one of my favorite college basketball parlays. And there's the correlation to the over. Baseball. You could continue the thread of correlative betting, or just tell us early on in the baseball season, what are your takeaways? So Colorado and the Chicago White Sox, this is extremely simplistic. I just think they suck. And I think you could bet against those teams all year long and you're going to make money. I think their season is over. Their players are depressed. They're probably going to be looking to unload the players. And this is an example where a lot of the math geeks, the stat geeks, just price each and every player based on their historical performance and come up with a number on the game. But I think what they don't price in is that if I'm playing for the White Sox, I'm not a team player. I just want to get my stats and get me the heck out of here and trade me to somebody good, right? Yeah, the, the White, White Sox, Sox and Colorado, big guy. Those are two teams Steve is recommending hammering the under. couple guys for the Rockies, shockingly, have had some good pitching outings. I don't know what's gotten into them, but their offense stinks is uh, really bad. But White Sox, all-time bad. 
also no life. Yeah, they, they are a lifeless team that is just waiting out the season. Luis Roberts down for a few months. Moncada's down for a few that's months. That's the dude that fell down going yes. to first. Yes. I can't believe <laughs> anyone in that city would buy a ticket and watch them in person. No home field advantage whatsoever. And because of that, and especially as we move forward, you know, in Colorado, I got to tell you, it screws you up. Your eyes, like the, the, the curveball only breaks two inches in Colorado and seven inches in Tampa Bay. So when you go on the road after a long homestand, now you're, you, you're completely um, unable to adjust your hitters to the, um, the, 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 the greater gravitational pull of the earth. I don't know what it is. Yes. The draft is one week away, Steve. How heavily will you be involved with the NFL draft? Oh, my goodness. I am woefully unprepared. I am embarrassed to, uh, to say Circa came out with a whole bunch of props. But here's, here, they did it right. I got ac- accolades for Circa because what they did is they just made $500 limits. They didn't beat their chest like we're going to take these big, big limits. They had over, under, and where people are going to go in the draft. And if they get Spencer Rattler wrong, no big deal. The betters will let them know, and they'll bet under or over, and the markets will adjust Jeffrey Benson as people will move the numbers. That is the way that good sports books that can manage their risk handle things like that. More suspect sports books, I'm not going to mention any names. I believe the South Point is not dealing any lines on this draft, though. I don't, so, I don't think they ever have the draft. Oh, they used to oh. years ago, years ago. But they got beat, and they went out and obviously looked to have some consultants <laughs> to explain to them why they were getting beat so that they could raise their act. No, they just gave up. They just said, I, yeah, no more. I, I, no more. I remember. Yes. The playing games, Steve Fezzik, right here in my notes, all unders. Go unders in the playing games, correct? I don't know, Patrick. It's complicated. At, at open, I'm another $80 pass post fine. Actually, $160, $40 times four. I played all four games under. But all these numbers have moved so quickly, it's harder and harder. It's a lot easier to win betting your stuff than making recommendations on bets for others. I played under 228 now for Lakers and for the Kings games. You want to play under 225? Not as good. <laughs> <laughs> 